Okay, my wonderful students, this, this is the last semester, the last lecture of the semester. Um, and I'll just say it's been a lot of fun having you guys, as I've said before. Uh, Uh, the final for you guys is next Tuesday. How much time? There's SI review next Monday, as I already mentioned. And, uh, and then final uh, at 10 a.m. Do not come at 1030. You have to be here at 10. If you're late, and if you're so late that you come after the first person has finished, which is going to be about 30 minutes, uh, you may not take the final. And you may think, Dr. B, I'll just come anyways, and he's a good guy. No, not on that. And I've done it before. I've done, and actually, I've done it in a couple midterms this semester. Students come way late, and no, they can't take it. Now, midterm is not a disaster, but for the final, yeah, it's a disaster. So make sure that you... Uh, you know, have about seven different alarms set and, and don't let your dog eat any of them or anything like that and just get here at 10, 10 o'clock sharp and I'll be here uh, ready for, for action. Now, just so you know, the basic structure is it's cumulative. So that means everything from August, our first lecture meeting, we talked about Galileo until today. We're talking about the periodic table. Also, it's about double the size. It, it is double the size of a midterm. So it's 100 points. But we actually have almost three times the amount of time to take it. Right? So instead of an hour for a midterm, which is what I plan on, sometimes you get a little more than that. But, uh, but instead of two hours for the final you have actually two hours and 50 minutes 170 minutes so uh, the time pressure won't be uh, too bodacious but uh, you'll still you know want to work carefully and and rapidly um, bring your scantron we'll fill up both sides of it so you might have 90 scantron dots and uh, 10 points in clicking or some variation thereof you know 75 Scantron dots and 25 points from clicking uh, or something on that order. But we'll definitely be most of, we'll, we'll definitely be all of the front and most of the back of the Scantron. So make sure you're here and, and ready to roll. Um, questions concerning the final? All right, let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about hydrogen. Last time we uh, used the diffraction grating uh, to look at hydrogen and actually helium and also neon. And the specific set, a countable set of colors is like the quantum, as I mentioned before, the quantum fingerprints of hydrogen, the quantum fingerprints of helium, and the quantum fingerprints of neon. And so when you're, you know, when you're an astronomer or anybody really, you, and you know what else? If you, if you listen to like Law and Order or CSI or, or any of those police shows, and they have lab results, um, and they say, well, we've detected traces of you know, some chemical or some substance, a lot of times they're, they're looking at spectra. You know, they put it into a, you know, some, uh, you know, like a little oven, they heat it up so it's gas, gaseous, and then they look at the, and it's probably gonna be infrared spectra. But, you know, with good spectrometers and stuff, they can, they can identify stuff. And they can identify the amounts 
by how intense, how bright the spectral lines are. So, um, now in this, this is a picture, take a look at this. Uh, this is a picture from a few semesters ago over in the Mathematical Sciences Building, the big subterranean lecture hall, 260, where we sometimes teach this class. And this is a photograph, me taking a photograph, kind of trying to get a diffraction image. This is the central image right here. This is the one that looks like a naked eye image, naked eyeball image, but you actually are looking through the diffraction grid. And it's just straight on, straight, you know, it's straight in to your eyeball uh, through the diffraction grading. That one you get for free. It doesn't split the, the colors. Actually, the colors split, but then they, they combine exactly right at the center. Okay, so you have diffraction, but they recombine exactly right at the center, and so you don't notice it any different from a naked eyeball observation. But once you look uh, a little bit to the right, you'll see other colors, and that's what we saw. We saw purpley blue lines like H gamma here, uh, and here's H beta, kind of this aqua colored line. And uh, most of you saw that uh, to the left. And to the right, you'll see at least one. Did anybody see more than one set of diffraction lines? Uh, a second set to the right or a second set to the left? Remember, anybody remember seeing that? Do you, Leonardo, you did? What about the rainbows when we had the incandescent light source? Anybody see two sets of rainbows to the right? And there, you remember seeing that? Yeah, so you'll sometimes see that depending on how dark the room is, how bright the source is and stuff. Yeah, theoretically, there's zillions of different replications of that diffraction pattern to the right and to the left. And sometimes, but usually you can just see one really well and maybe a second one. Uh, unless you're, you know, like the, like the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, they have really good equipment there. They'll see a whole lot of orders of diffraction. Anyway, so in this, in this photograph, you know, my, my picture wasn't big enough to capture the red H alpha, so that's off somewhere to the right of this picture. Here's a diffraction grating that we used, and this is somebody carefully holding it by the edge, not putting their greasy thumbprint on the clear plastic. And really, it's not really clear plastic. Here's what, here's what it looks like. And does anybody remember, did you make a note in your notes how many lines per millimeter your diffraction grading had? I mean, this one says 500, but I don't think everybody had the same. Uh, did anybody make a note of that? You remember, anybody? Do you, who, is, raise your hand if you, have, if you remember or if you wrote it down. Nobody? Okay, well, we'll assume it's 500 uh, lines per millimeter for everybody. Um, here's kind of a schematic of it. The lines are much closer than this. This is like one line every three millimeters, looks like. But here's face on. But the light goes through that diffraction grating. You know, it's blocked by the black lines that are photocopied on there. And the clear plastic part, they just go buzzing right through, and then they diffract. And at certain angles, you get that splitting of the lines. So the red will be split out to the right at a fairly wide angle, and the blues and violets a little bit closer in to the central image. So you're looking at the central image, and you look right, the first color you're going to see are those blues and purples, and a little bit further out, the reds and so on. Now, here's a kind of a schematic diagram of a red uh, light source. So, um, and this is an overhead view, so these these kind of, uh, get my cursor over here. These dashes here vertically through the middle of the diagram, uh, those correspond to the jailhouse bars in, the, in this diagram back here. So these, you know, these jailhouse bars here and here uh, that we're looking at kind of in perspective and face on, here we're looking at them overhead view. So the, the light goes in there and you get, uh, diffraction patterns, but only at certain positions do you, at certain angles, do you get constructive interference. 
All right, so at this angle, theta, you get constructive <laughs> interference. So you, you're up here, this is you, your eyeball, viewing this, uh, this is the H alpha line, for instance, okay, at that angle. And if you look at, at some other angle, you won't see it because you don't get constructive interference. And what I'm going to show you today is why you get constructive interference from a diffraction grating. And in this diagram, I like this diagram because it numbers each of the uh, rays going out. So wave number eight down here, uh, the last one on the bottom, to get to the eyeball up there, it travels the longest. It's got the farthest path. That's all right. And wave number seven, the next one, is got a little bit shorter path. Now, at this precise angle, the difference in the path length is one wavelength. Let me repeat that. At this precise angle, the difference in the path length between eight and seven is one wavelength. That's what this diagram tells you. Um, for wave number six, the path length difference relative to wave number eight is two wavelengths. Exactly. And that is why you get, you can come all the way down here if you want. Um, you, that is why at this precise angle and no others, you get constructive interference and you see a bright uh, red H alpha line. All right. So this is kind of, uh, this is kind of a schematic diagram of what's happened. Now, here's a close-up. And this is for spacing that's set at uh, 2,000 nanometers. Uh, you know, uh, 500 lines per millimeter is one line every 2,000 nanometers. Okay. And you can calculate that out. It's not hard. So now the, the and so this is like the bluish green H beta. And so it's dipping to the, you know, this is the overhead view, and it's dipping to the right at a specific angle. And again, it's marked as theta. And in this close-up, you can see right up here the path length distance. This little right triangle up here, this line segment right here, let me burn it in. Everybody look. Here it is. I'm going to burn it in. All right. That line segment is the difference in path length between this ray right here and the next one down. All right. And then this one, the third one down, is even closer. And the fourth one down, the fifth one down. So um, at this precise angle, you get um, that side of that little right triangle. Here's a close-up of that tiny right triangle. So this segment right here, the shortest segment, this is just a blow-up of that same diagram, uh, that's one what that's one lambda all right and when that die when when your wavelength fits in this part of the right triangle that sets the value of theta that sets the tilt angle so certain lambdas are going to go to certain uh, angle theta and that's it so if you measure theta the angle you can figure out lambda and that's why we do this now here's a Here's another look at it. Here's uh, an overhead view uh, in the lab. So here's like a laser. So you could do this with a laser, which has only one wavelength. You know, like a red laser pointer you can do it with, or a green laser pointer. Works fine. And you get the central image right over here. Okay, so there's a central image. And then up here you get one of your uh, H alpha lines. All right? At this precise angle theta subscript m. Now, this distance d is going to be, you know, like one or two meters, some, some, you know, distance that you measure with a tape measure. And same as the distance from y subscript m to y subscript c. You know, that's going to be some distance, you know, like on the wall that you measure with a straight edge or with a, a ruler or a tape measure. And so the reason that that, so let me emphasize, that lets you get this triangle. So this is the laboratory triangle, and guess what? 
it is exactly proportional in size to the tiny rectangle from the previous slide. You know, that one where, where the short side of the triangle, now, now it's down here, uh, the short side of the triangle, this is one lambda down here. Knowing that these two triangles are the same and knowing the hypotenuse on the tiny triangle is 2,000 nanometers, you know, that's, you know that from the manufacture <coughs> process. You know, they, they draw a line every 2,000 nanometers. And you, so you know the hypotenuse, you want to figure out lambda, you measure D and you measure this vertical and you just do proportional triangles. So these two babies, those two triangles are proportional and all you got to do is, you know, just do proportions and you can figure out lambda. So measuring the position of H alpha or any other color allows you to figure out lambda for H alpha. All right, you can do it in the lab and, you know, everybody in here could do it. It's, it's kind of fun, you know, it's, you know, you do it with, it's easy to do it with a, a red laser pointer because it just has one wavelength. And, you know, you measure it on the wall, you know, and you measure it on the lab table so far away from the wall. And you get, a, you get you're measuring nanometers. It's really cool. So, uh, so that's how that works. Now, let me ask you a clicker question about wavelengths and frequencies, if you please. And you know, with clicker questions, the thing about it is, if you're here, you're good. If you're not here, you don't, it's participation. I'm glad to see a lot of people here. Okay, question number one for today. All right, you measure the wavelength in the lab in the procedure I just mentioned. Kind of outlined it for you. You know, you measure D and you know, the position of H alpha, you get lambda. How do you get the frequency? Which formula? A, B, C, or D? And you know, the, the other section did really good on this. Okay, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Um, yeah, 98%, 95% of you guys got it correct. Use the wave equation. Yeah. C equals lambda F. C, you know, you just looked that up in the book or something. And then lambda you get from the lab, you know, measuring your stuff and doing a little bit of trig and, you know, Pythagorean theorem and proportional triangles and stuff. And then you can figure out F. And we've done that. You know, we figured out uh, the frequency of uh, the uh, 656 H alpha line. I believe it was 457 terahertz. And we did that in class a couple weeks ago, so... Now, why are the frequencies important? The frequencies tell you a lot about the energy levels uh, in the atom itself. You know, we, we talked last time about K times E squared over R being the electrical potential energy for hydrogen. You know, a proton, an electron, E times E, and then divide by R, and then multiply by K, and that gets you the energy. Uh, these wavelengths and frequencies can get you energies. Um, and that's because of the uh, idea developed by Einstein, first of all, that a ray of light, the photon of light, is a tiny bindle of energy that obeys this energy relation, that the energy of the photon is simply Planck's constant times the frequency. So you're in the lab, you use a diffraction grating, you measure lambda, all right. Then you use the wave equation, you get frequency, all right. Then Einstein says to get the energy of that photon, drop it into this equation, multiply by H, and bing, you'll have a number of joules or electron volts, you know, depending on, you know, what value you use for H, all right. 
Now, the other guy sitting in this picture in the, in the foreground, Niels Bohr, uh, is, uh, the, with his hand in his pocket over there, uh, he also figured out a critical atomic um, structure principle. And it had to do with the, um, the energy of, it, you know, he was working on hydrogen, and he was interested in the ground state the lowest energy state. And uh, what he said was, okay, when you're doing this, um, uh, the, the, the electrical potential energy, Ke squared over R, but how, you, how do you figure out R? You know, you can't measure an atom, and we can barely do it now, 100 years later. We can barely measure, you know, directly, you know, with the right equipment. But in his day, there was no... So what he said was, look, let me assume that the orbital angular momentum... Remember that? L equals MVR? MRV? Let me assume that the orbital angular momentum comes in bundles of Planck's constant. So some number N times Planck's constant H. So Einstein says, yeah, whatever the frequency is, Multiply that by Planck's constant, you get the energy. And Bohr said, all right, let's assume they're circular and that the MRV orbital angular momentum is you know, like 1H or 2H or 3H or 4H. And that number, 1, 2, 3, 4, is called the principal quantum number uh, of the atom. All right, and it's, it's actually the orbital number. So here's how it works, okay? We set up specific orbits and only specific size orbits. And then we say, all right, the electron only lives at certain altitudes or certain orbital radii, and each altitude has a certain EPE. And, and uh, Bohr said, yeah, if you, if you quantize the orbital angular momentum, um, you'll set the radii, all right? And it becomes countable, you know, because the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum is countable, 1h, 2h, 3h, 4h. So the energy levels, therefore, become countable. So those are the... And the orbits themselves. So the n equals 1 orbit, that's the ground state. Remember when we were doing the coil spring up here on the stage and we excited the, the fundamental mode and it was just, you know, one bump oscillating with a dip and then back to a bump. And then we did the first excited state, which was a bump and a dip, alternating with a dip and a bump. And then we did the second excited state. That's what... That, the reason we did that is because I knew that I wanted to talk about this diagram. The ground state is the, you know, we called it in the, in the, with the coil spring, we called it the fundamental mode. Einstein and Bohr called it the ground state, n equals one. First excited state, n equals two. And each one has a different frequency and a different wavelength. Now, how do we know that? Because we look at the spectra, okay? So we have countable energy levels. And we think about um, light being generated by an electron that drops, for instance, from n equals 3 down to n equals 2. Now, n equals 3 down n equals 2 in hydrogen, that sends out a photon of light called H alpha. That's the beautiful red H alpha line that we saw in lecture. All right. And so um, that's that quantum leap. Here's the quantum leap, all right? From n equals three down to n equals two. And it can't, it can't go from n equals three down to n equals 2.304 or 2.902 or anything like that. It can just go down, it's whole numbers. n equals three down to n equals two, that's it. And you know, Bohr didn't know why that was you know, required. Uh, but he said, if we do this, then all the, all the spectra are right on the money. Everything works out. 
You know, that you number the orbits, and then as the electron drops to lower EPE, it emits a photon. So it drops a little bit of EPE, and that, that missing EPE goes into the photon. And, that's, and you know that because of the um, Einstein relation, E equals HF, and F you know because you measured lambda in the laboratory. So the color of the photon and its energy, looking at the color of the, the unique colors for hydrogen, you know, looking at the quantum fingerprints for hydrogen tells you everything. Because you can figure out frequency, then energies, and then you can figure out everything about the orbital sizes and so forth. All right? But now, here's an unanswered question. You know, Bohr said, all right, let's, let's quantize those orbits. Bundles of H, 1H, 2H, 3H, and so on. But he said, you know, I'm just making this as a rule. I don't know why, but it does seem to work. It, it did work. I mean, he calculated it. Planck's constant, you know, it gave all the right frequencies and wavelengths. The colors were matched perfectly by his calculations. So he knew he was on the right track, but he didn't know why. Why does nature... Why does nature quant why, why are orbits quantized? You know, why does nature do that? You know, he, he said, yeah, if we assume they're quantized, everything works out, but he didn't know why they should be quantized. You know, it's, it's like it's like your mom saying, Well, uh, do the dishes, and you say, Well, why do you want me to do the dishes? And she says, Because I say so. Without giving you you know, like her hand, she might have a broken hand, so she can't do it in dishes. That would be the reason, you know. But if she just says, because I say. So Bohr was at the point where nature was saying, because I say so. But he didn't really know what the reason of nature was. But the guy that figured it out was this guy, Louis de Broglie. And he was about mm, 10, 15 years later. He wrote a PhD thesis, University of Paris. And, they, and, and actually, they, they, this guy is wild. They, you know, his professor said, whoa, we better, you know, let's send this PhD thesis to Albert Einstein and see what he says. And Einstein says, boy, this guy's got it. He's got it. This is the money. He's got it. He figured it out. And this is what he figured out. You know, why are orbits quantized? Because if you treat an electron as a wave, like our coils spring up here, and if you assume that the electron is going around and around on an orbit, and if you assume that it has a wave, then only certain wavelengths will fit on a given orbit. Because remember, the wavelength corresponds to a frequency. The frequency corresponds to an energy. So the energy and the size of the atom control the wavelengths. And so, so this is what... De Broglie said, if you think of the electron as having a wave property and then it curves around its orbit exactly the right wavelength so that it sets up a standing wave, in other words, constructively interfering with itself, uh, then everything works. So, so De Broglie said, all right, Professor Bohr up there in Denmark, the reason that nature said, because I say so, is this. Nature was thinking of electrons as waves. And a standing wave for a given, you know, so, the, for, so for hydrogen, it's a certain size nucleus, certain mass, certain charge, and so certain energies. And, there, and, and that is basically is what controls the wavelength. All right? And so n equals, so this little one down here, this is n equals one down in here. One squiggle. You know, so that's like our fundamental mode, operating between a bump to a dip, back to a bump, back to a dip. Except this one, it's going around and around in a circle, so it's, you know, one full wavelength. And then this one over here, this is n equals two. This is um, two full wavelengths. And then n equals 3, lovely. This is the second excited state, n equals 3, which we did in lecture. And, but, you know, we didn't do circular ones. We did just straight line. We, you know, we had the, 
the coil spring. You know, I wonder if we could do that. A coil spring on a circular shape. Because that's, that's what this is like. You know. And here's the other cool thing. You know, you know, it, it shouldn't have been a surprise. Surprise, you know, his De Broglie's thesis advisor was thinking, "Whoa, this guy's way out. We better sign his, send his thesis to Einstein. Let Einstein read it, see if it looks kosher." And Einstein said, "Boy, she's got it. This is on the money." But it shouldn't have surprised anybody because this is how it works with guitars. And that 88 string guitar that we call piano. And every stringed instrument, and matter of fact, every, every instrument that produces sound and notes, except, I guess, for a bugle. A bugle, did you know that you can blow uh, a, a bugle and you do different notes um, by how you blow through the, through the nose or through the mouthpiece? You know, and trumpeters, they have to do a lot with their with their, uh, you know, with how they blow. But, but, you know, like a violin, guitar, piano, uh, a banjo, anything that has strings. Yeah, you set the length of the string, ding, you know the, the, what the fundamental mode is going to be. You, you strum that string and bang, you have a tone. And that's, I mean, they design it to have, a, you know, like a, a D above middle C or whatever, you know, whatever note they want. Is anybody in here got a bass guitar? Is anybody? Uh, what uh, Sawyer? What notes? Do you, what are the strings on a bass? Do you know? Uh, anybody know the strings? I mean, cause I'm sure you could look it up. I mean, because you got to buy certain strings. You know, you break one, you got to buy a certain string. Uh, but you know, set the string length and the and the weight of the string, and Bing, you got your your note. And that's what we got here. So it shouldn't be any, you know. And here's the, so it, it's a mathematical theory as, as all physical sciences go. So, so de Broglie says, look, if you make the wavelength of the electron exactly Planck's constant divided by its momentum, ding, you have a standing wave for the hydrogen atom. It works exactly. So the momentum state controls the size of the wavelength. And, you know, the momentum state's controlled by how strong the nucleus is. You know, do you have a hydrogen nucleus, one proton? Or do you have uranium? Uranium's got 92 protons in there, so it's going to be really strong attraction. You know, the electron is going to be, and it goes electron by electron, one electron is going to be really strongly attracted to the uranium nucleus versus a hydrogen a nucleus. So here's the here's this is called the de Broglie relation. Lambda equals Planck's constant H over MV. We're going to do a calculation with that in just a minute. So this whole thing, you know, the the thinking that an electron and here's the kicker. The electron, it's still a particle. It's a wave. Behaves like a wave. Standing wave. It interferes with itself. Uh, and it's a particle. It has a precise location that we can, we can figure out. Kinetic energy, momentum and stuff. But it also behaves like a wave. So it's kind of like, you know, people call it the wave-particle duality. But it's not a duality. There's no two things. It's one thing. It's an electron. And similar for protons and neutrons. It's a... It, it, it's a, it's a particle that behaves as a wave. It's a wave that behaves as a particle at the same time and without thinking. It's, there's no duality. It's one. It's a one-ality. It's like saying, well, I have a bookcase that is also a horse. You know, that's kind of an outlandish combo, but that's what we got here. We got a particle and a wave, and they're simultaneously both things. And depending on how you measure it, you see wave properties. If you measure other things, you see particle properties. But you haven't changed anything about it. It's still an electron. So, um, you know, and, and getting back to the frequencies here and stuff, 
Now there's the ground state down there, like the fundamental mode, as I mentioned. N equals two, that's the first excited state. We got a pretty good one of those in lecture. And then, you know, the bigger one here in the, the outer blue wave, that would be the third or the second excited state. N equals three. And hydrogen H alpha is from the outer one here down to N equals two, but not all the way back to N equals one. That's a different atomic transition. All right. And the frequencies are, you know, the, the higher up they are, the, the, you know, the bigger the, you know, the, the, uh, the wavelength, the smaller the frequencies and so forth. All right. So here's a question for you. And we're just going to kind of breeze through here. And then we're going to do some clicking together on your review set. If an electron is particle, how can it also be a wave? Can you take an electron out of like a current? Um, you know, so in other words, an electron that's just buzzing through space and it's not attached to a hydrogen atom, just a free electron, uh, will it diffract? You know, and you know how, you know, depending on the wavelength of the electron, which depends on its momentum, you know, how do you, how do you send an electron into like our diffraction grating? Could we get diffraction of electrons through uh, a diffraction grating 2,000 nanometers? Answer is probably not. But you know what works pretty good? Crystals. Crystals have spacings on the order of nanometers and fractions of a nanometer. So that's, that'd be like going through a grid, you know, where you have atoms, you know, arranged in specific patterns and stuff. And, uh, and you know what? These guys figured it out. They found it. Matter of fact, they didn't even know what they had until de Broglie published his thesis. You know, they were at a conference. They were presenting these results. They were beaming electron through nick crystals of nickel. And they, they, they were reporting what they saw. They saw the electrons dipping over to the right and to the left symmetrically. And so somebody at the meeting said, well, look, this is electron diffraction, just like what Professor de Broglio, or Dr. de Broglie over in Paris, France, was just talking about a short while ago. And so then they realized, yeah, by, by George, you've got it. It really is. And so these guys, here's what it looks like. Uh, here's a modern day photograph. Yeah, you send it into a crystal. Now you send it into a powder of crystals. So all the crystals are randomly oriented, but you still get a pattern of rings. You don't get straight lines. You know, we sent our light through the jailhouse bars, the jail, the, the door of the jail, the jail bars. All right. And so we got, so what the diffraction pattern we saw was lines. This one, the, 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 uh, every, the crystals are all randomly oriented, so you get them in all directions. So instead of getting bars, you get rings. And that's what this is. And this is from 2011. We're still measuring that. All right. Now, I want to calculate um, the de Broglie wavelength for a macroscopic object, a paperclip. And a paperclip, go ahead and write this down because you're going to want to do this for your calculations in the homework. There's two homeworks that are going to start active at 2.30 this afternoon. One, your regular homework, and one, your mega review for bonus points. Okay, so paperclip supposedly has a mass of about one gram. All right, and let's say that it has a momentum of 2.65 times 10 to the minus 3 kilogram meters per second. That means it's going at 2.65 meters per second. All right, so that's a walking speed. You know, so if you're with a friend and you're hustling uh, from class over to the rec center to work out, you might be going this speed. All right, so, this, so a paper clip, yeah, you can get a paper clip going this speed. Let's figure out its wavelength. So all you do is you take Planck's constant, and we're going to use the joule second version of Planck's constant because we're working with a paper clip. And we'll put that in the numerator, and then we'll put the momentum in the denominator and we'll just calculate all right so this is the de Broglie this is a simple calculation but it's one that we do all the time in particle physics and astrophysics here we go okay so the numerator Planck's constant and notice 
I've changed it from joule seconds to kilogram meters squared per second. That's actually angular momentum. <coughs> Planck's constant is units of angular momentum, as I've said about 9,000 times. So you got this big, nasty, and hey, you, you know what? You better get used to scientific notation. You're going to have to practice with that for your homework. And then the momentum down on the bottom. Now look at the, look at the units. Kilograms cancel. Meters cancel bottom and meters on top, but you still have one unit of meters on top because the top starts with square meters. And that's all right because um, you want me and per seconds cancel. You want meters, um, one unit of meters because you're working for, a, you're trying to figure out a wavelength. A wavelength is in meters. All right. And so you just calculate. And so 6.63 and 2.65, so that's going to be about 2 point something. Anybody have 2 point something on that? What do you got? 2.5. Anybody got a 2.5? Anybody verify? Nobody verifies. Double check it. Come on. Verify. You got it? Okay. Yeah, that's what I got too. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 31. Oh my goodness. Oh my gracious. That is really, really small. It's way, it's many powers of 10 smaller than a hydrogen nucleus. I mean, this, this wavelength makes the hydrogen nucleus look like as big as the sun to us. All right, so it's just, it's just very, very small. And for this reason, um, with this really small wavelength, um, it's many orders of 10, many powers of 10, smaller than, for instance, your pocket. So when you take a paper clip out of your pocket at 2.65 meters per second, you're not going to see any diffraction effects. Wavelength is too small. It just buzzes right through. In other words, it behaves like a particle or like a rigid object. All right? And humans, theoretically, you're, a, you're not really rigid, but you're kind of fairly well connected and anatomically. And theoretically, you do have a wavelength, but your wavelength is so small that it's going to be even smaller than a paperclip. You know, a paperclip at walking speed, paperclip, 10 to the minus 31 meters, forget about it. You, at the same speed, really small, even smaller than that, forget about it. So you're never, macroscopic objects, because the wavelengths are so small, will not display diffraction effects. But atoms, electrons, at the wazoo. And that is how atoms are put together. Matter of fact, the periodic table here, almost finished. The periodic table encodes all of this. Every, and here's what you want to remember about the periodic table. It's called the periodic table of elements. And an element is defined chemically as all the atoms that have the same number of protons in the nucleus, because that controls uh, the chemistry. The number of protons in the nucleus controls how many electrons orbit a neutral atom. All right? And neutral atoms are usually the things that you put together in a chemical reaction. And you know, they might ionize and stuff, and you know, salt. In salt water will ionize and stuff, but but eventually, but initially they're, they're neutral. So knowing the number of protons that tells you in the nucleus tells you basically all you need to know about the chemistry, chemical reactions and stuff. It's all encoded in this. This is Mendeleev's periodic table. Every slot. corresponds to different orbital energies and different and, and actually the electron spin 
is also involved. We haven't talked about that, but the electron also has spin angular momentum as well as orbital. Every nucleus is unique. And so every nucleus, every cell, every block on this periodic table has its own wavelengths. So what that makes it like is every cell, every block on the periodic table is like a different kind of a guitar. You know, cello. Think of all the different stringed instruments you've ever heard of. Violin, viola, a cello, bass, fiddle, piano, banjo. And that's the stringed instruments. And you can keep going, you know, with, with other instruments. So everything on this table is like, you know, some kind of a stringed instrument. Like, you know, here's a picture of Chet Atkins with his guitar. And what that does, all these different elements... You're made up of stuff. You're made up of different instruments for the periodic table. When you eat chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A, you know, say somebody gives you a scholarship to go buy them because they're so expensive. Those chicken nuggets, yeah, they, that's like a... They're made up of different instruments. So when... You know, G Galileo, you know, he, he, you know, the, the original quote that we started the semester with, the universe is a grand book, open, continually open to our gaze. But its language is mathematical, and it's written in symbols, circles, and triangles, and other geometric figures. So Galileo, you know, this, this, this whole thing that we do, the physical science project of the last 500 years, you know, Galileo started thinking mathematically, but really, another good way to think about it is this an amazing symphony. Every time you look at something, you know, your brother, your cell phone, your real boss, you know, some beautiful sunset. You're looking at a symphony. You're, you're looking visually at a symphony from the periodic table. All right, that concludes the semester for instruction. And let me pause this. Thanks.